Next up, we have Richard Owen from Owen's CX Group. He'll be speaking on uh, the topic of he helped invent NPS, but here's how we should really think about, or excuse me, yeah. Let me rephrase that. He helped invent NPS, but here's how we really th should be thinking about CX. A uh, fun fact about Richard is he, along with his wife, were asked to take or were asked to be a part of an advertising campaign for a health club in Tokyo in an effort to attract more foreign visitors. Part of the photo shoot involved being in a pool, so technically he's a professional swimsuit model as well. I guess it didn't take, so, and he's not that big in Japan, but he's big here, so without further ado, Richard. I was, I was looking at my, uh, my name tag, and it sort of evolved. When I, when I arrived here, the name of my company is ONCX. Is anyone here from the Midwest, by the way? Do we have, yes? My wife's from the Midwest, she's from Iowa, and there's a city in Iowa called um, Iowa City. And their nickname, their, their tagline is, all of our creativity went into our name. <laughs> and I feel like something sympathetic to that when I call my company ONCX. It's like all our creativity went into our name. But I started off as ONCX, and then I noticed uh, on the agenda I'd got down to CX Group, which sort of sounded nicer. It's a little more succinct. And now I've got down to CX Workout, <laughs> which maybe they're looking at me. Maybe I need to lose weight. I'm feeling really <laughs> guilty about that. Um, 17 or 18 years ago, <clears throat> we did a research project to try and determine whether or not customer loyalty matters. I mean, that just sounds like such a stupid idea, right? How could customer loyalty not matter? But for the 1990s, nobody thought customer loyalty mattered. Customer satisfaction was predominantly the way we thought about things, and customer satisfaction was largely not generating any useful results because satisfied customers kept leaving businesses. And so a lot of CEOs became quite jaded about this idea. It's nice, goes well on the billboard, no one cares. And we've done extensive research with Bain and Company looking at correlations between different ways in which customers approach businesses and different financial factors, and the Net Promoter Score was born. And subsequent to that, it's an estimate that 40% of the global 1,000 company, to one degree or another, adopt Net Promoter Score or CX programs. Um, and so it's a bit of a shock to realize it's not really working terribly well. And we've come to this rather dark realization that CX is this great topic everyone talks about and a great topic that no one spends money on or actually executes terribly well. And so I'm going to give you a light at the end of the tunnel here a little bit, but I'm going to suggest that if we're going to be sitting here 10 years from now talking about customer experience as a practice, as a discipline, it's not going to be doing what we're doing today. Because if we keep doing what we're doing today, we're not going to enjoy any good results. Um, so how did we end up in, in, in this sort of position? Well, as I say, about 15, 17 years ago, we started with this concept of net promoter score. And we came to this rather grim realization that companies weren't getting benefits. Now, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. I'll get into some more specifics around why that's the case. As we did our research, we drew one fundamental conclusion which was the reason that top executives don't get behind CX, why CX is failing, is because the data fundamentally is so substandard in the CX industry that nobody in their right mind would make serious decisions based on it. And so no matter how many times we say, oh, CX is important to our company, we're not going to make big bets based on the current quality of information we have in front of us. It's actually irrational for senior leadership teams to take seriously CX data. And the second thing we learned was a lot of confusion around the term insight. Insight's a very fashionable word. But what most people do is they don't actually gain any insights. They basically barely get to the point where they understand status. If you go to most companies and say, do you actually know your current performance? They don't. And so the idea they'd have sophisticated insights on how to perform or improve performance is so far out of reach for them today because they couldn't tell you how they're actually performing. One of the things we do is we audit public company NPS reports for those companies. They're about to announce to Wall Street they have an NPS of 60 or so. Actually, it's usually a really high score. <laughs> you know, we're not about to go to Wall Street and say, oh, our NPS is minus five. 
And so they say, well, can you come in and look at our data and tell us whether or not we should tell Wall Street this is our number? And our opening statement is always, happy to do that. But before we start charging you money for this, I want to advise you, you're probably not going to like what we have to say. We'll do a cursory initial consulting session just to advise you how bad your data is. Then decide whether you really want to do this, because you're going to discover that your numbers are rubbish. And they'll laugh about it and say, that can't be true. We know what we're doing. We do initial consulting session, and the CFO is usually horrified and stops talking about NPS. And that's the end of the conversation. So companies not only lack, ex lack good data, they lack good insight. They don't execute. And there were some great conversations earlier today about the importance of execution. Execution is just terrible in most corporations. Um, so we sort of set out to think, well, how can we solve any of these problems usefully? And this is why we started a new business two years ago to try and solve what's quite a hard problem, we think, which is how do we actually make CX work? Um, so let's start with the definition of what failure is. Our data suggests, and we've had over about 1,000 enterprise implementations, and about 40,000 companies have provided us with data over the last 15 years. Only about 5% of CX programs meet a reasonable standard of performance. Now, reasonable standards might mean different things to different people. If your standard of performance for CX is, hey, we run a program, we ask some survey questions, we get some data back, you're golden. You're probably able to accomplish that. If your standard rises to, we want to see some business results as a result of us investing in CX, you're down to 5%. Companies are not getting any kind of business result. Worse, most CX programs have something like a 50% mortality rate over a three to five year period. And if an executive sponsor leaves a company, there's about a 50% chance, coincidentally, the program just gets killed. That's not exactly a sustainable high quality industry where one change in management, most companies are one change in management away from killing an entire CX initiative. If you look at the funding CX programs have compared with any other type of cross company initiative, they're typically receiving 25% of the funding that is reasonably expected to run that kind of initiative. And most CX leaders will say, we're not getting enough money to be successful. Most top executives say, we're not giving you the money because we have no faith you'll be successful. So it's not clear whether it's a cause of failure or a symptom of failure. I think it's a symptom of failure. I think top executives we interview would put money behind CX if they believe they get results for it. But our inability to either deliver or convince people of our ability to deliver means they won't fund it. That's not irrational, ladies and gentlemen. They're not Luddites. They're actually being quite sensible. But the net fact is they're not investing. So it's worth asking ourselves at this point, not an unreasonable question, is the whole idea just a bad idea? Did we get this wrong? And it doesn't seem very likely. Um, first of all, we've got, excuse me, We've got a tremendous amount of data that suggests that companies, that thin strip of companies that do well, really get outstanding results. Furthermore, if we look at the economics of CX, they've proven very resilient over time. So this is study work we did a decade ago with Bain and Company, where we looked at companies um, defining, first of all, their competition based on CX from 2010 to 2018, 36% of companies defined CX as a major competitive factor. Now it's up to 89%. Now let's assume for the sake of argument that some of that is just chit chat, right? Because nobody likes to say we don't care about our customers. No, CX isn't important. So there's a lot of lip service, no doubt, based in this. But it's still a reasonable comparable. CX is clearly in people's imagination. It's clearly seen as important. Furthermore, we know that companies that perform in CX, the 8% of companies that Bain and Satmetrics back in the day identified as being actual performers versus the 80% who don't perform. And this is a study we did where we looked at what customers really thought about these companies as opposed to what executives thought. Um, the group that performed showed better economic performance 
in terms of growth rates, but also profitability, cost of customer acquisition, lifetime value calculations, employee retention. In fact, over 10 or 15 years, the list just keeps getting longer. It's if you're at the top of your game, if you're a CX leader, life is really good. Most of you probably here are quite familiar with a company, Rackspace, who just used to be down the road, San Antonio, still is San Antonio. Great company. Um, one of the dirty secrets about Rackspace for many years was they were able to pay their support employees less than the market because people wanted to work at Rackspace because the support culture was so customer centric. They could get a, something like a 5, 10% discount on market rates. People essentially were paying themselves less to work for a company that was that customer centric. There are so many ways in which economics work in your favor if you're a leader. In fact, flip it on its head. What do you think you have to pay people to work at PG&E right now? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, what would you pay me? I mean, the top executive at PG&E, who wants that job? How much do you have to pay someone to be a political football running a company that set fire to the state of California. It's a miserable job, ladies and gentlemen, and you couldn't pay me enough to take it. There's a premium for companies that are challenged. Furthermore, we're living in an era of what's often referred to as the Red Queen theory. Those of you who have classical educations remember Alice in Wonderland, the Red Queen, and the Red Queen theory is that you have to run faster and faster to stay in the same place. You have to get better and better and better. And we see these examples all the time, right? Think today about what you consider table stakes for a customer experience compared to 10 years ago, right? You want a mobile app. You need to be able to schedule everything online. 10 years ago, he didn't do any of that. Now it's table stakes. The bar keeps getting higher. So there seems to be an amplified gap between leaders and laggards, and the companies that are falling behind are only seeing further gaps. And in fact, that's reflected in the stock market. It's reflected in the concentration of equity growth amongst a relatively small number of companies. The S&P has more or less doubled since 2008, but there's a very high concentration of capital gains in leaders. It's not an equitable world. The leaders are pulling ahead. Okay, so it seems to me like there's a hard case to make that it's a conceptual problem around CX. So what is it? Well, some of the speakers earlier made the same point. It's execution, stupid. It's a great idea, but can you execute? So, so what's execution based on in CX? Well, it's really two or three key ideas. The first is executive action. CX is a matter of making choices about how to deploy assets in corporations. That's a fancy word for saying, where are you going to spend your money? What are you going to be good at? Are you going to invest in R&D? Are you going to invest in service support? Are you going to de-invest and take profits? These are asset decisions top executives make. And if you go and talk to leaders in global 100 companies and ask them what their job is, their job is making decisions around how to allocate resources. And so CX improvements come as a result of executives making decisions to allocate resources differently. The second thing we all recognize is no point in allocating resources all over the place if the employee base isn't engaged. So we have this broad challenge in trying to get thousands of employees engaged. And we all know that companies that have very high level of employee engagement outperform those that don't. And it's easy to say. It's incredibly hard to do, especially for companies that are, are very, very large. And then finally, because of the Red Queen, we have to change. Businesses have to advance and change. We know change management's exceptionally hard. So these three things tend to make the core of what execution really is in the CX world. And so if companies not doing this is the symptom, why aren't they doing this? What's blocking them? And we've identified three things that recur in all of our studies. The first is that CX is often thought of as an independent strategy that has nothing to do with the rest of the company. We've got an NPS of 20, can we make it 30? Go solve that problem, right? That is nothing to do with the business of the company. It may, makes no sense as a statement. The second problem is, as I said earlier, 
the data on which companies are making decisions is so wholly inadequate that senior executives will not invest on that basis. And the third problem is that we have organizational culture and operational problems based on a long-standing way of organizing business that dates back to the 1950s. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. So let's break these down. First of all, strategy. What's the core problem? Well, nothing matters in CX if it's not in the context of competition. We know that winning performance in every industry is different. You can win in the telecommunications industry with a net promoter score of zero. You can win in the luxury hotel business with a net promoter score of 80. If you're in an industry when you're winning with a net promoter score of zero, you're, unless you're in an industry which is highly regulated or highly monopolistic, and so you're able to get away with it, sooner or later somebody comes in and reinvents your industry who's probably completely new. Taxi cabs sucked universally. They were in a low MPS industry, but they were making lots of money because the competition was even worse. Highly government regulated, very hard barriers to entry, very hard to differentiate. Uber comes along, disrupts the industry, very high NPS business. Classic story of an outside threat disrupting a low NPS industry. So that works. But if that doesn't happen to you, you can win with very low scores. So some industries tend to win low scores, some industry high scores, but it's all in a competitive context. How do you intend to compete? Who are you competing against? What are your substitute products? How do you differentiate with CX relative to the competition? That's not very well understood by most companies. Secondly, how much money is in there for CX? A very, very simple question. What's the economic differentiation between a promoter and a detractor in a company? How much more is a promoter worth than a detractor? You might be quite surprised. In some industries, the gap is very small. In other industries, it's absolutely colossal. If you're going to ask top executives to invest millions of dollars in transformational programs, you better have some idea about what kind of return investment to get. Moving a net promoter score up 10 points in a lot of companies could be prohibitively expensive relative to the rewards they expect, or it could be the bargain of a lifetime. But if you don't have a financial framework for understanding it, it makes no sense to invest in it at all. And the third point, and probably the most important of the three, is that it's even questionable as to whether you want to have an aggregate market-leading NPS. Let me put this to you this way. Let's imagine that your industry is comprised of extremely profitable customers who are poised to grow over the next decade, and an extremely large group of highly unprofitable customers that are going to stay flat to declining. Does it matter that you have a high NPS for every single customer? Or does it matter that you're absolutely knocking it out the park for the high growth, high profit customers, and you're simply avoiding reputational damage with the other group? Some companies have found that actually reducing aggregate NPS, but improving targeted performance amongst high profit, high growth segments is the financially most attractive strategy. The notion that you have this broad brand level story for a whole company is not smart and is not targeted sufficiently. And so strategy tends to be divorced. So these three elements are examples of how corporate strategy and CX strategy don't get connected sufficiently. And as a consequence, we lack a compelling argument or a compelling strategy for focusing on how we should improve. Improving NPS from A to B is a meaningless statement. If it's not in the con context of competition, target market segments, strategies for growth, ROI. If we're not making those discussions happen, we're not making smart decisions. OK, but that's the easy stuff. So fashion your seatbelts, because things get a lot worse. Data. I had to throw this in, because I just love this quote from the Marx Brothers. Who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Right? Um, there's a real problem with the data sets we use. We're using a data model that basically dates back to about the 1960s, when consumer research had its first sort of inklings about how we could get data on mass group performance. We'd go and we'd sample people, and we had sampling strategy, and we'd extrapolate, and we'd understand how groups work. 
Let me give you a standard for today. Any business today that runs on data wants to know the status of every one of its customers at least daily. Against that standard, most CX data is about 5% of that. Most CX programs generate data on a customer every six months, and at best, they understand the performance of 10% of their customers. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the dark ages. You couldn't run a CRM program like that, digital transformation program like that, a website like that. In fact, there's no other part of the company that's data-driven that deals with such a horrendously bad data set. And the problem is, we're dependent exclusively on collecting data based on data customers are willing to give us in surveys. Oh, and by the way, survey rates are going to decline over time because of the saturation effect of more and more surveys going out. So not only do we have a bad data source, but the data source is getting worse. The second thing we know is that companies have tremendous problems understanding how to organize all their different sources of CX data to give them a really accurate picture of performance. And this ranges from companies that ask the wrong people the wrong questions at the wrong time to trying to figure out how to deal with different transactions that occur that you're measuring in the contact center versus trying to figure out brand level performance and how these things tie together. There's a tremendous amount of confusion around the topology of CX data. And as a consequence, most companies can't really claim to understand how they perform. Let me give you a great example. Brilliant company used to work with um, called Travel Counselors. They're an absolute leader in the marketplace in the UK. And they perform what you consider to be old style travel agency work. They build customized schedules for their customers. You'd think this business shouldn't exist, but it's like $600 million business. They're really good at what they do. And the first time I spoke to them, they said, you know, we have the world's highest NPS score for our industry. And I hear this a lot. So I said, explain to me how you measure it. They said, well, before you do that, what's your brand promise? Our brand promise is you will have the best vacation experience of your life. I said, great. That sounds like a really good brand promise. I get behind that. How do you measure NPS? Well, we measure it after they book the, the, the travel. I said, we haven't delivered on your brand promise yet. I said, well, yeah, lots can go wrong after that. <laughs> we got a really high NPS after they book it. I said, yeah, I bet you do. But you're not a travel, you're not Expedia. If you're Expedia and the brand promise is we help you book efficiently, it makes perfect sense to ask someone after the booking. But your brand promise is you're going to have the best travel experience of your life. You have to ask them when they get home. They said, but that'll be a much lower NPS score. Now, by the way, they still have a very high NPS score after that. That's a timing problem. It's a very simple timing problem. Businesses make so many basic decisions wrong in terms of how they time collection, who they collect from, how they weight the answers. In most instances, most companies could not, in all honesty, tell you where they are today in terms of their performance. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is worse than having no data at all because you can get into a lot of trouble if you don't know your performance. The misquote that I always most enjoy is the one from The Big Short. Everyone remember that movie? It's brilliant. Right at the start of the movie, they have this fantastic quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that ain't so. Mark Twain never said it. And Mark Twain, by the way, the most, number one in the world, most incorrectly quoted human being is Mark Twain. Winston Churchill is a close second. So every time you see a quote attributed to Churchill or Mark Twain, it's probably nothing to do with them. But it's a great made-up story anyway. So people are flying blind. Um, they don't know their performance, as we already said. The second mistake they make is they confuse raw data with insight, which I'm sure a lot of you understand the distinction. We're not giving them anything they can act upon. We're just throwing reports at them. You know, the industry generates colossal amounts of data with, that tells businesses nothing they find useful. Executive perspectives of the data they get from CX programs are radically different than what CX leaders think they're giving their executives. What we believe we're giving the executives is transparent, clear calls to action. Executives come back and say, I don't know what the heck to do with this. It's unactionable. 
Are companies hard to do business with? What the heck does that mean? They don't like us? Most problems are arcanely defined and arcanely reported. Um, and worse, because we're giving people bad information, if they're acting on them, they're likely to create crashes. OK, so we resort to data science. And data science is the new sort of high priest, right? We all like data science. Um, and data scientists are fantastic at taking large sets of data. And they look in the toolkit, and they say, oh, I've got all these great tools. right? I'm going to pull out my wrench that does machine learning. OK, I'm going to crank that for a while, see what happens. The problem is that it's not a data science problem. It's an understanding about how CX data links to business data. And by the way, there's a running joke in, in Silicon Valley, and you probably all recognize this, that when you're pitching a company, you say it's an AI company. I, it doesn't matter what you do. You say it's an AI company. Everyone understand this, right? I mean, we work, obviously, as an AI company. And we worked out really well for them, I think you all noticed. Uh, so your pitch is it's AI. When you're recruiting people, you call it machine learning because engineers want to work for machine learning. And what you're actually doing is regression, ladies and gentlemen. That's basically it. So AI becomes machine learning actually is regression. Data scientists are the new high priest, but it's not actually getting anywhere. And nobody understands statistics, ladies and gentlemen. Executives do not understand stats. You go into presentations where everything is framed as a series of brilliant insights around statistics, it means absolutely nothing. By the way, they're usually too embarrassed to stick their hand up and say, uh, I must have done, over the years, more than 500 presentations involving key driver charts. And I never saw a leadership team stick their hand up and say, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I guarantee you, most of those audiences didn't understand bivariate correlation. I don't understand bivariate correlation. I was presenting it. OK. The final problem with data is we're constantly trying to replace human beings with data. Now, there are lots of reasons why this is a bad idea, not only because, as a species, we could really do with survival. But also, data is not going to solve all our problems. Human judgment in selling situations, in assessments of other human beings, has a lot of value. There's some great research came out of MIT which showed that combinations of human judgment and machine judgment outperform either human judgment or machine judgment in 90% of scenarios. Forget what Elon Musk says for a second. In practice, we're going to do very well with augmented decision making. We need to provide data sets that human beings can understand, can juxtapose with their own judgment, and work together. So we've got all of these challenges to solve with CX data. How do we solve it? Well, the good news is, after about two years of research, there are some techniques coming along that's really pointing towards this. The first is, surveys have tremendous value in being able to not be used as a primary data source, but being used as a mechanism to calibrate predictive engines that then are used as the primary data source. That may sound very long-winded, but think of it this way. Because of the limitations of our ability to get data on all customers from surveys, we should stop thinking of surveys as the primary source of data. Think of it as a mechanism for fine-tuning the machine. What does the machine do? The machine predicts human behavior. So instead of relying on a once or twice a year survey, we run predictive behavior of every customer every single day. And we use surveys to calibrate that prediction. Instead of getting 23% of individuals in B2B, we get every single customer, every single day, responding to every single signal or change in information source that occurs in your business. Because we have data exhausts. We have signals. What we need to know is how to interpret all those different signals to change our status. This isn't actually pie in the sky. This is something that is being run today at multiple large companies and works. And it requires technology that you already have in front of you. Survey engines like Question Pro to build the calibration and machine learning engines that take that calibration and apply it to the data exhaust of your customers. So think of this as an ultra-responsive system to every signal a customer sends you. The premise for it's very straightforward. 
we noticed over about 10 years of data that in most industries, customers responded very, very predictably to events that occurred to them. And most companies knew what those events were. Let me give you a good example, make it very practical. So let's say that my flight is delayed six hours. I get a survey from the airline saying, are you happy about your flight? What do you think? Right? Now, the question is, given the flight was delayed six hours, there should be a probabilistic model that tells them whether or not I'm likely to be unhappy or not. If it's delayed one hour, or two hours, or six hours, it's all a mathematical problem, right? It's all probabilities. Now, they don't know for sure I'm a detractor, but they can reweight my probability based on what they know about what happened to me. So why ask me? Well, you might say, yeah, it's not the same, though. Guessing, prediction, it's not the same as asking customers. Ladies and gentlemen, customers don't know their own point of view one minute to the next. You could ask a customer a question, and the next day they give you a different answer. Predictive models are actually superior because what they tell you is how a customer should be feeling based on how you treated them. If you're lucky enough that they're more forgiving than that, then you got lucky. But it's a foundation. And so surveys will change dramatically in the next 10 years in their role, and predictive models will become the predominant way that companies build understanding of their customer behavior. And this solves the data problem. It solves it completely. We go away from 5% data coverage to 100% data coverage through this solution. Every single signal drives action. Everything the customer does or experiences that you can trap as a business, that you can measure, recomputes the probability of them being a promoter, passive, or detractor. It's basic machine learning. I hate buzzword bingo. Call it AI, call it machine learning. It's stats. And then at the end of the day, all you care about as a business person is, has anything changed? If I recompute all the probabilities and my largest account hasn't changed from being a promoter to being a promoter, I don't need to know that. I just want to be told if something happened. When we talked to top executives and said, what do you want out of CX? They wanted two things. Number one is they wanted to know what should they focus on doing for their business to improve CX? Very simple, stack rank it for me. Tell me the top three things. And they wanted to know if something went wrong with their largest accounts. And they wanted to know immediately if something went wrong. Both those things are achievable with these kind of systems. The other benefit of this is it's quite practical to simulate almost exact improvements in performance in your business based on multiple operational factors in your business. That's a, quite a mouthful. But what I'm basically saying is you can model out the creation of promoters or detractors very precisely based on how you set the operating parameters in your business. I'm a logistics company, and I want to take my delivery performance threshold from five days to four days. What will that do to my MPS? It's actually a very precisely calculable benefit. So flip it on its head. I want to create my, take my MPS from 10 to 20. Which operational parameters do I need to change and by how much? And if I can do that, I can set goals for my business. I can create improvement plans. So simulation is a very practical benefit associated with this. On top of that, there's one other thing that makes all this much easier. And it turns out that in just about every industry, there's a tremendous amount of commonality. So you don't have to build models that are unique for every company. You can build models that are often consistent across companies within industry. Remember we said industry scores are different? Well, that also helps solve a data problem because we can pool data within an industry and improve the algorithms based on a composite industry performance. Does that make sense to everyone? Much easier to aggregate data within a single industry. And the vast amount of data that an industry has improves the forecastability. It kind of makes sense. You set expectations based on your other experiences in that industry, right? I mean, if you're an airline passenger, to quote an off-used example, you behave pretty much the same way. You treat just about every airline the same way in terms of your expectations. So reference designs at an industry level make this much more efficient. OK, let me talk about organization as the third one. So we've kind of gone from very soft topics to very hard and scientific topics and back to a more soft topic. Post-rationalization within organizations. This is. Um, 
as it says, not an oil painting, right? It's not Jackson Pollock. What, is, what are we talking about? Organizational design since the 1950s has been based on one fundamental premise, which is functional efficiency. Let's build functions and let's get really good at doing them. We have a finance department over here. We'll have guys who are in manufacturing over here. The problem is most organizations need to be reorganized along customer lines because subsegmentation of customer behavior means you have to build all these different components together to satisfy custom, unique customer segment requirements. This is a massive transition for companies. They're fundamentally stuck with this. And they're trying to solve it by focusing on data sets within individual functions when nobody cares how individual functions perform from a customer perspective. So we've got a fundamental misconnect between how customers want companies to be organized and how companies are organized themselves. You know, for, for nine years I worked based out of here in Austin for Dell Computer Corporation. And um, Dell organized its business along customer segment lines. And I thought that's how every business organized themselves. Every, we had something like 20 different customer segment organizations. I mean, even within something like education, we'd break our organization down to K through 12 and universities. And the amount of power in that organization that was devoted to focusing on delivering end-to-end operations designed around a customer segment was phenomenal and accounted for a lot of the company's successes in the 90s and the 2000s. But most companies still organize fundamentally along functional lines. And customer experience is an inherently cross-functional problem to be solved. So organizations are essentially fighting amongst themselves as to how to allocate resources as opposed to organized around allocating them for customers. The other problem I point to is CX often lacks a natural home within the organization, which is something I'm sure many of you would, would identify with. Fifteen years ago, we ran research that said the logical home for CX is marketing. Why? Because no marketer 10, 15 years from now will think of marketing as purely acquisition. Every marketer will understand lifetime value is the purpose of marketing. And so retention and customer upsell, cross-sell is going to be the heartbeat of the marketing organization. We were dead wrong. 15 years on, most marketers still think of acquisition as their primary purpose. And so CX in marketing is often an anomaly. Something's got to change. Either marketers decide they really do care about lifetime value, in which case it's a great home for CX, or CX needs to find a new home outside marketing. Service was the other organization that typically stu stuck its hand up and said, we should own CX because, hey, we're the guys that care. Service, we're all about CX, beating heart. Our people are on the phone to customers every single day. The problem with service organizations is their number one objective is often to sustain service organizations. So every solution to a CX problem is let's build a bigger service organization. Not a natural home. Now you get chief customer officers. And if you look at the topology of chief customer officers, too often they're a figurehead in the organization without access to real resources and without access to real clout. How many chief customer officers are a stop from the CEO job? Anyone see CCOs getting promoted to CEO any day soon? It's not considered yet a role that is a powerful center of operations within the company. So we're struggling to find homes. We still believe that marketing is the right home, but we think marketing needs to change as a home to be the right home for CX. So these are organizational challenges. As a result of organizational challenges, we're allocating the wrong resources to the wrong things. The last study we did on CX programs showed that 70 to 80 percent of the budget is fully consumed with trying to collect data. Well, that's absurd. Can you think of any other program in the company where the vast majority of resources are spent trying to figure out what the data is, as opposed to actually trying to institute change management programs, execute all the things that actually create outcomes for the company? That's a consequence of two problems. One is it's how we structure CX programs. The second problem is it's simply underfunded. And it's underfunded because when we pitch CX programs, we tend to sugar the pill. 
If you went into an organization and said, your CX initiative is going to cost you $10 million a year for the next five years, people are scared they'd never get this, the time of day. And they wouldn't. But imagine if they said, I can demonstrate a clear path to $100 million of savings through CX initiatives. Now I'm asking you to make a $10 million investment. A combination of better economic analysis coupled with proper budgets would elevate the entire industry. And that is critical because failing that, what we continue to do is spend small amounts of money doing some basic survey collection. And we're surprised we don't get transformative results. Or as Waldo Emerson said, money often costs too much to obtain. We're scared to go out and tell top executives what it'll cost to transform the company in CX because we're scared to point to, uh, commit to, the kind of economic benefits that would justify that investment. Until the CX industry flips that on its head and says, this is not cheap, this is going to be a big investment, but it's going to be worth it, and we'll show a path to real business outcomes, executives won't do that. Let me tell you a conversation I had, and I know I'm just about to get the, the bell to ring on me, uh, with a bunch of PE executives. So I met with a group of about a dozen PE leaders and said, surely every company you acquire should be adopting an aggressive program to both understand and improve CX. You know, PE guys typically have a five-year time horizon. They want to essentially get 4x the money in about five years. So what better way to do it than take a company you've bought and just transform the CX, have an economic impact, four years, you can do it, double your money, everyone's a winner. Stop cutting costs, start investing. Um, and they said, to a person, if you can demonstrate within 30 to 60 days the economic impact associated with a major MPS change in our business, we'll invest whatever it takes. We have a very simple formula. Show me the money. Most companies today can't answer that question. And the PE guys aren't crazy. That's a pretty rational thing to ask for. So imagine if, if they're asking for it, why would not every public investor? But if you can answer the question, I believe the investment will come. So I'm going to wrap up here, but I wanted to leave you with an epilogue and another piece of work that we're doing right now, which I think might be useful in answering some of these questions. And it's a value chain. And I'm not going to run through every level here, but it's an economic analysis framework that takes every layer of CX and estimates its impact on the overall economic structure of the company. And, and the point I'm making here is not to say that this is the be all and end all or it's the right way to do things. In your business, if you don't get that economic infrastructure clear in your mind, you're going to continue to underfund, underdevelop, and underperform. So to recap, unless the industry and all of us start to transform, we're going to find that CX programs, I think, are going to remain underfunded, underdeveloped, and underperforming. There are now, I think, very clear paths forward. I think there are better strategic tools that enable us to start to put CX in the context of business strategy as opposed to being isolated. I think there are far better data and technology tools. And with question probe technology and some of these machine learning algorithms, you can do this if you have the ambition and get that data up to the level required, without which we're not going to win this battle. And then finally, we need to drive organizations to organizational transformation in terms of structure without which they won't get great results. Our research suggests consistently that leadership in large organizations globally not only are willing to go down this path, but also are fully rational in their assessment of how they should do this. Our challenge collectively is to rise to that standard and give them the kind of direction that they need in order to accomplish those goals. Thank you all very much.